Okay, this is Hung Wei. I'd like to like call this meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Thank you. And I will begin with you, Vice Chair Wei. Here. Director Scodola. Here. Abby Koga. Here. Walia. Here. Thank you. I will note that currently Director Meadows is absent, but we do have a quorum of the committee. Right, thank you. So now uh, we're gonna open up to uh, oral communications, public comments for items that's not on the agenda. Do we have any uh, public that wish to speak? I don't see anything on my part. No, I'm no. Alrighty, so I will close the public comments as going to um, consent agenda. Is uh, number one A is to approve the minutes of the October 5th, 2023 Finance and Administration Committee's meetings minutes. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Um, okay. Do I need to open the public comment for consent agenda too? Uh, yes, please. All right. So I'm going to open public comment for consent agenda. Do we see anyone on the attending? No. Seeing none, I'll close the consent agenda. Let's move to approval of number one, minutes of October 5th, 2023. May I have a motion, please? And Vice Chair, if I could also add that this is also a 1A and 1B. 1B is to approve staff to- That's the right. We'll, okay, well, consent agenda as one item. May I have a motion, please? A motion to approve the consent calendar. Okay, so Margaret, uh, motion, second, please? Second. Second by, sorry, I missed it. That's Director Scozola. Okay, great, great. We have a move and second. Uh, may we vote vote by a roll call? Yes, thank <clears> you. <throat> uh, Vice Chair Wei. Aye. Dr. Scozola. Aye. Meadows. Aye. Abe Koga. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Walia. Uh, I have just a comment that I was not here for the 1A item, uh, but I have reviewed the minutes and there are two members here who were at that meeting, uh, Vice Chair Hung Wei and uh, Director Margaret Abikova. So I fully support that. Okay. Thank you so much. That motion carries. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Now we're going to our regular <clears throat> calendar, number two, selection of 2023 Silicon Valley Clean Energy Finance and Administration Committee Chair and Vice Chair. Um, I'd like to open this for the public comment, please. Do we have any public that wish to come in? Seeing none, I will close the public comments period and asking for nominations for chair, please. I move Vice Chair Wei as chair. A second, Abhi Koga. All right, so moved by Meadows. Meadows and second by Avacoba. And then um, any discussions? If not, we'll do a roll call. Thank you. Director Scozola. Aye. Thank you. Director Wei. Aye. Meadows. Aye. Avacoba. Aye. Walia. Aye. Thank you. That motion carries for Director Hong Wei to serve as chair of the 2023 Finance and Administration Committee. Thank you, everyone, for the nomination. Uh, so let's go to the vice chair nomination. May I have a nomination, please? And we will come self nomination, too. Uh, Margaret? Chair, I haven't asked, but I'm going to just put it out there. Um, I would like to nominate uh, um, Director Meadows for Vice Chair if she would accept. May I have a second, please? Second I'm, happy to, I'm happy to second. Second by Tina. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussions? If not, we're going for a roll call vote. Thank you. Chair Wei? Aye. Director Meadows? Uh, aye. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. <laughs> <laughs> I Abby gave Koga? everyone concern there a minute. <laughs> Abe Koga? Aye. Walia? Aye. Kozola? Aye. 
Thank you. And that motion carries for Director Meadows to serve as Vice Chair of the 2023 Finance Administration Committee. Wonderful. Now we have a chair and vice chair. We're in business. So let's go to item number two. Recommend that Silicon Valley Clean Energy Board of Directors approve the mid-year 2022-2023 adjusted operating budget. And do we have a staff report? Yes, uh, Chair, I will take that item. We do have a staff report that went out and we have a presentation. First of all, I just wanna welcome everyone to the committee and thank you for joining this committee. I'll give a brief overview. Some of you are new to the committee. We, uh, the Finance and Admin Committee uh, meets at least once a quarter and can meet as often as, as necessary. And the topics we cover obviously are budget related and, and anything financial planning and reporting related. So this includes our annual budget and, and today's meeting we're covering media budget. We also discuss investment strategy. Last year, the, the, we brought forward the new uh, changes to our investment policy and we hired a new uh, investment advisor to enhance our investment earnings. The other things we talk about are rate changes, anything a admin and personnel policy related uh, issues. Uh, we have brought power prepay transactions to the committee and we're uh, concluding, uh, we're going a <clears throat> doing a report out of the, the second transaction with, that we just finished. Our plan is to meet at least once a quarter. Um, and again, we can meet as often as necessary. The next meeting is likely to be in May. And Andrea will poll the committee members for, for the exact timing of that. But that uh, meeting, we will likely go through uh, our stress test analysis, which I'll also cover briefly today. Uh, plans for that. Um, and then the next, uh, and if we are in position to do so, we'll also talk about the framework for the upcoming budget. And then in, in July, we, as you know, we don't have any committee meetings or board meetings. So very early on in August, the committee will convene to review the annual budget before it, it's a draft of it is submitted to the board in August. <clears throat> and then the budget gets adopted by the board in September. And then we will meet sometime in in uh, in the fall, depending on what's what's the the pertinent issue at that time. Most likely, it will be the upcoming rate change for the following year. So that's a brief highlight. And and uh, any if anyone has any questions on the committee overview, I'm I'll be happy to take that. Otherwise, I'll move forward with the uh, media operating budget. Any questions from uh, the board? If not, let's move to um, uh, the, I the, see. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Dr. Oh, yes. Um, <clears throat> Meadows, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so I was curious about um, if this is beginning next month and moving forward, if this is going to be an in-person meeting, uh, is it considered, uh, I assume it's a public subcommittee, so it should be in person. Uh, or has that already been previously discussed by this group before this meeting? No, that's an excellent topic. Uh, we are going to operate uh, under the traditional Brown Act. So Andrea can correct me, but we will have in-person meetings in our office, but I believe the members can participate remotely as long as you're in our service area. Andrea, can you, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct, Amra. As long as you are um, participating from a publicly accessible location and provide me advance notice so I can put that on the agenda, then you can participate from somewhere other than the SBC office. Okay, very good. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, I have a follow-up question on that. Do we need a quorum um, to be in the sample in the um, location in order um, to do Yes, we will need a quorum within the service territory so long as nobody would like to use AB 2449. If somebody would like to use AB 2449, we would need a quorum in one physical location. Tina, you have a question? Yeah, follow up. Uh, Andrea, we were talking about this the other day as well. Mm -hmm. So just for completeness clarification, so under that AB 2449, if two locations have been 
advance noticed as let's say SVCE office and uh, let's say city of uh, Cupertino. And at that time, does one of the two locations has to have quorum or between the two locations, there is a quorum? One location would need to have a quorum. It could be either. It could be, I think our preference would be for the SVCE office, but. Right, but it could, okay. Yeah, but just wanted to bring a highlight this because we were talking about this at the executive committee meeting the other day. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Oh, we have another hand raised. Director Elliott. Uh, yeah, um, so we can totally pass on this if it's unrelated, but um, in regards to when we meet, I understand that we get pulled obviously and kind of base it on the majority of when it's most convenient for people. But just for me, uh, for example, I have my day job, my teaching job. And so I take the day off to, to do anything in the afternoon. It's much easier for me personally to do things more in the late afternoon or, or evening. And I understand it's kind of a democratic thing on when we meet, but I was wondering, especially if we're meeting in person, if, um, if there's, I just want to put that out there for everyone else. I, I know everyone has different, you know, schedules and everything, but for me personally, it'd be much more convenient if we were able to do that, much like our, our regularly scheduled meetings that's in the evening time. I just want to put that out there. So maybe Andrea can do a, um, a survey or a doodle for us to decide on a date and time. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll do that. Thank you. All right, if no more questions, um, we're gonna have Amit, um, Amrit continue. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'll go through the mid-year operating budget and let me just uh, go with the next slide and tell you what we plan to cover today. So this is an action item. We will be asking that the committee uh, vote, take a vote at the end of my presentation. And what we're asking is that you recommend that the board adopt the mid-year operating budget as we're presenting it to you today. And this will be on the uh, agenda item for the, for the March board meeting. And for discussion today, I'm gonna briefly review the budget timeline. So where we are in this process and how how we generally do budget here at SVCE. Um, and when I go to the timeline, you'll see that the budget, the annual budget was adopted in, um, in uh, September of last year for fiscal year that starts October 1st, 2020, for current fiscal year starts October 1st, 2022, and will end on September 30th, 2023. And this is, we as we do every year, we do a mid-year update. This is our mid-year update, and I'm going to highlight the changes uh, that we're proposing now relative to the annual budget that was adopted last September. And then we'll look at some of the key line items that are major key line, line items that are changing. We will update, uh, provide an update. You'll see that two big item components that are changing is our revenues and our power supply expenses. So we'll go through those two in detail. And then we look at how our reserve projections uh, are looking. We'll provide an update on our staffing update, and then we'll ask for the committee's vote. Okay. And I don't mind questions during the presentation. So if at any point uh, you have questions, please feel free to, to interrupt me. Okay, so let's, Andrea, let's begin with the timeline. <clears throat> uh, so as I said, we start our process um, we do the annual budget planning in, in July. We actually present the framework to the exec committee in June. And if we have a budget uh, finance committee meeting, we can also present it to the finance committee. That would be our preference, but sometimes the timing doesn't work out and the exec committee meets every month. So, so at, a, at a minimum, we present the framework starting in June to the exec committee. Then we, based on that framework, we do the analysis in, in July. Then at the very beginning of August, we will review the draft with, with the finance and admin committee. And then we take the we have we take the draft budget to the full board and ask that the board provide any comment before we take it back to the board for final adoption. We want to make sure before we begin our new operating um, uh, fiscal year that we have an adopted budget. So the board will uh, adopt in September as they adopted this budget the, for this fiscal year in September 14th. Then what happened when the board adopted the, the annual budget in September, at that time, the board had 
had agreed on a 2% customer discount rate, overall customer discount rate. But the board said, you know, and we were projecting a very good financial year at that time. And I'll go through the numbers. And the board, uh, a lot of that uh, is based on a lot of assumptions. And a big part of that assumption is how the CPUC will adapt PG&E's rates and the PCIA charges that PG&E charges our customers. And I'll go into the detail of that as well. And that can have a big impact on the numbers we project. So the board said, let's, before we commit to spending any more money, let's wait until we have certainty on those two, at least parameters in late December um, before we take any more action. So in December, when we went back to the board, when we had more certainty on the likely rate the CPC was adapt was going to adapt, we showed that you know our margins were actually going to be even better. And we we're projecting it to be even better at that time, based on what the CPC was to adapt and based on where the power prices were at that time. So the board at that time said, let's increase the general overall discount from two percent to four percent, in addition to one percent that was gonna be translated in dollar bill credits to our low income customers. So overall a 5% discount but 4% general discount for all customers. And the board also at that point adopted to increase our decarbonization funding programs by 19 million. So those changes are now reflected in, in the media budget that I'll be presenting to you and also updated for the assumptions on power supply and where the final rate changes uh, came out to be. So I review those changes. Once the committee's uh, feedback is incorporated, we will incorporate your, your feedback if, and bring those changes uh, for board's consideration in March for for them to adopt the new uh, uh, adopt the media adjusted operating budget for for the current fiscal year. So that's the timeline, and we can go on the next slide, Andrea. So the big highlights, <clears throat> we're projecting this to be a very, very good financial year. Uh, one of the better years if the assumptions prevail. At the time when, when the annual budget was adopted, we were projecting 115.5 million in net contribution to reserves. Um, but again, with the caveat that the board was gonna revisit the rate uh, and, and funding for decarbonization programs or additional spending in December. So in December, the board, as I mentioned, uh, increased our discount by an additional 2%, so overall discount to 4% in addition to 1% to low income customers in 1% in translating dollar bill credits, which really to them means a discount of somewhere around an additional 12% to low income customers. And then the increased program spending of about 19 million. Uh, so the table on the right walks the, the difference, the drop from 115 million to the current projection of 73.4 million. So the additional 2% cost is about 10 million and the increase in program spending is about 19 million. So close to 29 to 30 million uh, that the board uh, uh, close to 30 million or 29 million of the 42 million is is because of the board authorization to increase our funding. Again, 2% for customer discount and 19 for programs. Then what happened is the energy energy supply expenses increased. You know, we energy prices are very volatile. And when we do our budget, annual budget in, in July of each year, we basically look at what power prices are trading at and we basically take that price and, and, and develop our budget, but that price changes day to day and prices since then skyrocketed. And we remember the last um, board meeting, Grish talked about how natural gas prices have gone through the roof and natural gas prices still on the margin sets our uh, power prices. So that drove increase, significantly increased power prices. So our prices in the month of December, January and February have been very, very high. And since then, the forward prices have come down and it's very volatile and we'll go through that. The net Im impact as we stand right now is an increase of 67 million. But the revenues also increased by 50 million more than we anticipated in, in July. And that's because of the final rate that the CPC adopted for PG&E turned out to be higher than what we had anticipated. And I'll go through that. 
And then the other 4 million discrepancy is we have higher investment income, you know, pursuing the investment strategy that we, we um, that the board adopted last year. And, and our other operating expenses came down and that's mainly due to staffing vacancies uh, that we were not able to fill. Okay, so that's a big highlight in terms of the changes from what the board adapted to what we're projecting today. It's a 42 million reduction, but again, a very good financial year. Okay, so next slide, we'll, we'll look in, in the details. So you can see the year, year, year over year change that, that shows the changes from the budget adopted in, in September to what we were recommending for adoption in, in, uh, in March. The revenues, as I said, increased uh, 40 million. It would have been 50 million, but 2% was uh, reflects the 10 million for the 2% additional discount. So that brought it down to, to 40 million, 67 million in energy supply expenses, which I'll go through in detail. And then the minor adjustments in the operating and non-operating uh, revenues, uh, operating expenses, the 740,000 again for staffing vacancies, and the non-operating revenues have increased because of higher expected investment earnings uh, because of the new investment strategy where we've invested at higher yielding uh, investments. Okay. And then the, the two nine and a half million, the 19 million that the board authorized for additional funding for decarbonization programs, nine and a half million for multifamily direct install program, and the other nine and a half million for the <clears throat> electrification discount, where we customers who qualify for the all electric rate are providing additional discount of 10% to basically further incentivize uh, adoption of, the, uh, of that rate or adoption of electrification. So this is a very good budget. It supports an overall dis custom, customer discount of, of 4%, additional monthly bill credits, and there's a typo there. It's it's working out to be about 1250 a month, not 1050 a month. We we're expecting 1250 for about eight months, which we is reflected in the staff report. And a transfer to our DCOP programs, in addition to the 19 million that the board authorized, the other allocations that we have, the annual allocation and the savings from nuclear allocations, bringing total transfer close to 31 million towards our decarbonization programs. Okay. We'll go to the next slide where we'll look at um, why our revenues increased by by 40 million or 50 million if it were not for the additional 2% customer discount. So when we adopted the budget at that time, we were forecasting PG&E's gen rate. Again, we don't have insights into PG&E rates. We get an early indication from PG&E when they file a preliminary error forecast around May of each year. And when they made that filing, that was actually showing rates to be even lower than 12.95, which we adopted. We used the Cal CCA new gen model, which is a very good model to basically project where their rate would be. And at that time we were projecting even higher than what PG&E was indicating at that time of 12.95 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, and the PCIA at that time, again, PCIA is a charge the PG&E charges our customers, CCA customers. And it's basically a charge that PG&E says, hey, CCA customers, when you were our customer, when you were part of PG&E customer, we made certain commitments on your behalf of the long-term power purchase agreements. And to the extent they are out of the money, you, got, you have to pay for those. And they take a timestamp of when the customers departed uh, and, and basically calculate based on that vintage what each CCA's customers owes. And we were forecasting at that time to be zero and may even dip into negative territory for the first time. In other words, a credit for us. But when the actual numbers came in and the, and the, uh, the analysis settled, it came in to be slightly higher than, than 0 0.28 cents, which is incredibly low given historically where they have been. So it's, it's, it's a very good rate. And the pg and &E generation rate that the CPUC adopted was much higher, about 15.5% higher. So our overall margin, the rate we charge our customer, that's the blue box, instead of charging 12.69 cents on a weighted average 
basis. Again, each customer is on a different rate class and, and the rates are, are different for each of the rate classes, but on a weighted average basis, you know, we were able to go from 12.69 to 14.08 cents. So that increased our revenues. Um, and then we had, and then we upped our discount to 4%. Uh, so net in net, that brought in additional 40 million for us, even after offsetting the 2% additional discount. Okay. And we'll go to the next slide where we'll look at the other big change, which is on the power supply cost. So the chart, there's a detailed chart uh, in, in the appendix. So, so you can have, uh, you can look at the details uh, more granularly, but you can see the, the story here. You can see the big increase, the orange line is basically the prices is the time we developed this forecast, which was at the beginning of this month. The gray line is where the prices were when we set the annual budget. You can see a big increase, sharp increase in December and January. That's because the gas prices spiked in California. You probably heard in the news, a lot of customers complaining about the heating bills to PG&E. But the same dynamics drove power prices higher and, and significantly increased our, our cost. On a forward basis, prices have come down. Uh, uh, around the beginning of the year or late last year, even those prices were a lot higher. Um, but that's a dynamic of power markets. They can go up and they can go down. So this is this is a key key risk that we want to want to manage to. Uh, do, uh, Director Scazzola, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I I was curious if. Like, what was the explanation in a nutshell for the the spike, this giant spike in the price? Yeah, so big big spike was really driven by natural gas prices. Uh, so on the margin, natural gas is still burned as the big presentation we had in the February board meeting to generate electricity. So that drove electricity prices higher, but what drove natural gas prices higher? The number of dynamics going on, one is reduction in storage capacity in, in natural gas and some of the storage, normally the way gas markets work is, is PG&E and other uh, gas companies store gas during the summer periods because gas usage increases in the winter for primarily because of heating. But also we had the heat wave in electricity in in uh, in the September timeframe. So that drew a lot of gas out. So our storage inventories were low and some of the storage was also reclassified from PG&E from working gas to to cushion gas, basically not gas that's available for, for usage. And so storage inventories were low. And then also one of the major pipelines bringing gas from Texas to, to California was out. Uh, there was some, some corrosion on that line and that line needed to go through uh, the pipeline FIMSA testing requirements before they could increase the, the uh, pressure and therefore the deliverability of that gas to California. So that reduced the flow significantly to coming into California. And then there was a overall cold weather, here, not only here, but in major markets, in the East Coast, as well as in Canada. A lot of the gas we would have expected coming from Canada was also staying in Canada. So all those perfect combinations really drove gas to an unprecedented levels. And for us, it drove our, our energy prices high. So energy prices is this very volatile. This is why we always advocate for stress testing. We always advocate for holding adequate reserves uh, because we we cannot, no one can predict prices. A lot of things can happen. So so that's the phenomenon that drove this price high. And of course, prices and power prices, when we were looking at prices back in December, even the forward-looking prices were coming in very high. And since then, those prices have, have come down. And that's probably because of changing market dynamics with hydro production, all those things people are now factoring in that are driving the economics. Uh, uh, um, or the the picture of where prices would be, and just okay. today, I, the report today's report was prices are higher than where they, where they were in Friday. So <laughs> they go up and down depending on on market conditions. 
That makes sense. Thank you. Um, I was curious, though, is there any international effect or are we strictly looking at, you know, domestic or I, I, I mean, especially with the, the Ukraine conflict going on, I know that we're, we're now shipping a ton of liquefied natural gas over to Europe these days, but uh, does that have any effect on us or are we strictly a, a domestic, like we have domestic factors that are that at play for, for these for these spikes, I mean, or higher, the, I, I understand it's volatile, but is is that affecting us? Overall market picture, it does have an impact. The more liquefied natural gas obviously reduces domestic uh, gas available for domestic consumption. But this particular phenomenon is not so much national market. A lot of this is due for regional impact, which was the pipeline outage, mm. low storage inventories in the West, and cold weather. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I appreciate so the, it. But that does tighten the market. So I can't say it doesn't have an impact. It does have an impact. Okay. But even if we if that were not there, the pipeline outage had the big impact in this spike. Cool. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, so when prices go up, our cost of, of serving our customers goes up. We do hedge. We hedge significant portion of it. So we insulate our portfolio from this price volatility, but we not always perfectly hedge. Uh, you know, because we have hourly load shapes and we buy blocks of power. So that's one reason. And then we have some remaining open position based on our hedging hedging uh, profile in our risk management, uh, energy risk management policy. So as of the time of this presentation, we were 86% hedged. So that net open position, the prices drove our open position cost higher by about 32 million. But then, as Monica can explain and has explained before, you know there are other dy dynamics. We talked about resource adequacy quite a bit at the last board meeting. Those prices have gone through the roof because of the tight capacity market in California. Uh, here we're showing six million, but that's a you may say that's not a big increase. It's actually a huge increase compared to prior years because when we set the annual budget, we were we had already anticipated a large increase. So this is incremental on top of that. And then our environmental products, renewable power uh, prices, the PCC1 products that we buy, the cost of those have gone through the roof. So all these factors are, are driving to the $67 million increase in, in energy cost. Okay. And we'll go to the next uh, slide. So how does our reserves look? As I said, reserves is an important component of our risk management strategy. This is how we're able to withstand the volatility in our power market. Because the volatility, as um, uh, I can explain, um, not only affects our power supply portfolio, but also affects our revenues. Because remember that revenue slide I talked about, the PG&E rate, how power prices move affects their rate, and more importantly, affects PCIA. If power prices are low, PCIA will be very high. Um, so it affects revenues, affects our power supply costs. So we need this cushion to basically manage our business and make sure we don't get into a cast catastrophic situation where we run out of cash or or become very uncompetitive relative to, to PG&E. So currently, if this projection prevails. We are looking at, we're ending the year at 305 million or 265 days of cash on hand, but this accounts for unspent program dollars or that dollars that we project, we will not have spent by this time. Uh, but the chart, uh, the numbers below show, what if we were to take that, ac that accounting out, all the reserve dollars out? And the reason we show it in the reserves is because the board always has that option should we go into an emergency to say, take unspent dollars and, and redirect it. Um, but we don't wanna be in that position. So if we take that out, we would have 252 million in reserves or 219 days of cash on hand. And our target is to be at 285 days. And the way the target is set is, is related to the stress test item, which is next on the agenda. So last year, the board, we presented to the board stress test analysis. We said, hey, look at these extreme risks that can that we can, extreme but plausible risks that we face. And if they were to occur, they can take significant 
reserve dollars. So we, we based on that analysis, we upped our target uh, to 200 and, and I think from 235 to 285 days of cash on hand. And, um, and we're going to re redo those, that analysis again. And based on the new analysis, uh, the board can will revisit these targets again uh, in in September, in August and September, and the committee in uh, most likely in May or in in uh, in uh, in the beginning of April. Uh, I'm sorry, beginning of August before we go to the to the board. Okay. So those were the main items for the budget and we'll cover some of the, in the next slide, we'll cover some of the other minor changes. And I'll give you an update on the staffing. Uh, so staffing, um, we are budgeted for 49 full-time uh, positions. We are not asking for any changes in our staffing level. When we presented the media, but uh, the annual budget, we said we may be looking for additional hires at this time for in our, uh, decarbonization uh, uh, policy and programs group. At this point, we are not asking for it. We, we will probably do so at the annual budget. And the reason is because we are we're, um, trying to fill the current vacant positions as well as onboard and, and, and assimilate the, the new staff. Uh, so as of now, I'm pleased to say that uh, of the 14 vacancies, five, there have been five uh, positions that are uh, that where the offers have been extend, ac accepted, and we're looking to onboard them in the in the coming few weeks. So that brings our if once they come on board, our vacancy will go down from fourteen to nine, and we're actively recruiting. It's a tight labor market uh, uh, because we look for very specific skill sets and the same skill sets that all these other CCAs and and energy companies look for. So that makes it a challenge to to full, fill these positions, but we are engaged with uh, with professional uh, staffing recruiters who are, are helping us uh, fill these vacancies. Okay, so I will summarize the, the budget in the next slide. So there are a lot of uncertainties, you know, we covered some of them, power prices being the big one. Uh, we're still, despite those, we're looking at a good year. But we we want to build reserves. We're hopefully we're taking this favorable um, favorable financial year to to build our reserves to our to our targets. We will revisit those targets again uh, at the annual budget cycle based on the stress test analysis. Uh, this is a good budget. We're able to further our mission. We were able to put close to thirty two million uh, or thirty one million dollars towards decarbonization, which includes the 19 million that the board authorized in December. We have a good healthy discount relative to pg e of 4% and an additional 1% uh, to our uh, low income customers. And again, we will conduct stress test analysis to basically revisit the adequacy of, of our reserves to see uh, if, if those targets are right and, and should we make any changes to those when we, when we adopt the annual budget. That was uh, all I wanted to cover on the media budget. Any questions? Thank you, Amit. That's a lot to cover. So <laughs> we'll open up for questions before we go to public comments. Um, so I have a question. So we have yeah. a very comfortable um, you know, reserve. Um, so is this a good amount to continue or consider the uh, volatile you know, of the market? Do we do anticipate to increase it or decrease it? So I, I, so this is exactly you're you're teeing me up for the next discussion. <laughs> That'll be a nice segue to the stress test analysis. So we're going to conduct a stress test analysis like we did last year, and that's going to tell us, you know, what we the scenario that we want to model. What's the extreme? but plausible event that can happen that we've seen happen in the past that could happen. And do we have adequate reserves to withstand that? And you're asking me to project before doing the analysis. My projection is we are probably not gonna reduce the target. We're probably gonna keep it or maybe up it. But chances are we're gonna be somewhere close to where we are. Um, 
to be able to withstand the type of, uh, of risks we're facing. Okay, thank you. Any questions, um, Sally? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so you probably explained this many times, but this is my first time on the committee. So I'm gonna ask questions which may be basic or not. Um, so looking at the um, the discount that was applied this year uh, up from two to 4%. And so I wondered if, if you've weighed the pros and cons of managing to a set discount do customers like opening their um you know their letters every year and saying oh this year it's one percent this year it's two this year it's 0.5 you know versus if it's a steady amount but then they probably don't pay attention to it because it doesn't change so what are the you know it's not an insignificant amount of money um so what are the pros and cons or is it just done this way in the industry that every year, based on how things are going, um, you adjust it? I just wondered the philosophy behind that. And if you prefer not to talk about that, because this is a little bit more you know, philo philosophical, um, that's fine too. We don't have to cover it today. No, that's a very, very good question. And, and the board actively discusses this uh, just about every budget, uh, every time we adopt the budget and every time we adopt the rate change. So this is a very good question. So our we want to be competitive to PG&E. Uh, there are CCAs that charge more than uh, PG&E, and they've been able to do so and retain good amount of customers. We probably have the highest customer retention of all CCAs. About 90% or more of our customers are with us, and we're very pleased with that, and we want to keep that. Uh, one of the considerations we take into account is that we serve, unlike some of the other CCAs, a large chunk of, of CNI commercial and industrial customers. They make a good chunk of our volume, or two thirds of our volume. And those customers are very sensitive to prices. So we wanna be in a position to say, you're getting a better quality product that you can stand behind that's greener than PG&E at a discount. So our preference, since we've been in, in, in uh, operating in our inception, we've been able to stay below pg and &E. Last year um, or the year before, we were at 1% because the margins were tight and, and, and uh, not the fiscal year that ended last year, the fiscal year that ended the year before last, uh, we operated at a loss. Even the, but we still maintain the 1% discount rate because we felt important and that's why we built reserves so that we can provide competitive rates. So in terms of keeping a set rate level, uh, our preference is, is, uh, is more driven by being competitive to PG&E versus one set number because we do have to look at our financial projections and where we are and what, what the right balance is. And also we have to weigh with uh, serving our mission, you know, providing competitive rate is part of our mission. The other part is also making sure that we are, um, we, we are actively, um, uh, you know, uh, help, helping move the needle on decarbonization efforts in our communities. So that's a big part of, of, of all of the, the trade-ins that go into these discussions. Okay, and is it board policy to not dip that number below one percent, even if it takes reserves, or not as explicit as that? There is. We do not have a board explicit policy uh, because if we do need to stay financially viable, mm -hmm. and we need to go over, we, we will probably ask for that. But our preference is not to plan financially, be financially planned such that we're not in that position. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the clarifications. Yeah. Any other questions? Although we will also need a committee vote on this that recommend the board adopt the adjusted budget. If no more questions, I think I'll open to public comments. I think we do have one attendee, um, but I don't see a hands raised. So if not, I'll close the public comments. Now we're back to uh, board discussions. Or a uh, motion, uh, Margaret? Chair, um, I, I was planning to make a motion, but just um, some comments. Thank you to 
Emery and the team for um, this. It's a real, um, it's some of it is a guessing game. And I, I think this is um, in response to Director Meta's comments um, because we are dependent on what pg e does and the market and so forth. So, and, and yes, we do have a policy of trying to stay at least 1% below um, pg e rates and um, to be competitive. And um, I remember the early on conversations about this, um, you know, for some communities, people believe in the cause and are able to afford to pay whatever it, necessary to, you know, be more green, but in other, we have such a diverse, um, you know, county and, and member, member agencies that for some count, uh, cities, it, it is, uh, the, the cost is important. Um, so it's been really trying to balance all of that and then trying to like predict what might happen. And then, but some, and sometimes we're on and sometimes we're not. And so that's just this constant adjustment that we have to go through. And that's really what this committee spent a lot of time doing. Um, but um, yeah, so it, it, it is actually, unfortunately, um, pretty um, volatile and we're just trying to like, you know, make sure we can balance everything out and have enough money in the reserves, but also, you know, our, our customer base wants us to do programs and get the money out to the community. So trying to just, you know, pull all the levers and kind of come to equilibrium is what, um, you know, Amrit's job is really, I think, a real challenge, but um, I, I think we've been able to navigate pretty well so far, and, and I, I, I think we will continue to do that. So with that, I would like to make the motion to um, move staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. May I have a second, please? Second, Meadows. Second by Meadows. And um, any further discussions? If not, let's have a roll call uh, vote, please. Yes, thank you. Chair Wayne. Aye. Vice Chair Meadows. Aye. Chair Pascozola. Aye. Ali Toga. Aye. Walia. Aye, with a big thank you to Amrit and his team. Thank you. And that motion carries. Thank you. I, and I, I, I second that uh, appreciation because these are really big numbers and there are a lot of risk involved. So we feel very um, fortunate that we have a team that's dedicated and knowledgeable and to uh, make sure that Silicon Valley Clean Energy goes forward. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you on behalf of all the team at SBC. It takes the whole uh, organization to pull together the budget. So on, on behalf of them, thank you for, for the, your approval. All right. Thank you very much. Now we're moving to number four, which is, uh, wait a minute, number four, yes. Enterprise Risk Management Framework and Stress Test Scenario Proposal. Um, do we have a staff report, please? Yes, so there was a staff report. I will go through the highlights of that as I've captured it in this presentation. And this will, this nice, you guys have provided me a nice segue with the discussion we had on the, on the media budget and the volatility. So how do we manage risks? So this year, um, we're building off of what we did last year. We're introducing, uh, a, a more comprehensive enterprise risk management framework. This is in the, in the early stages of development. So what we wanted to do was present the framework and, and also uh, discuss with you the proposed stress test we want to do that we will then use for reserve planning uh, for next year's budgeting. So with that, we'll go to the next slide, Andrea. <clears throat> so this is an information item. There's no committee action required other than we would like to capture your feedback on the proposed stress test analysis. Uh, and what I plan to do is quickly review last year's stress test analysis that we did. And what do we mean by ERM or enterprise risk management? What's the distinction between ERM and stress test and why ERM now and why we just did stress test, stress test last year? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about components of ERM, and as I'll do that, you get the hint there that stress test is part of ERM. ERM is just a more comprehensive way of managing risk. So we'll go through all three components that we've listed here, risk, reg risk matrix, risk register, and stress test. And then we'll, uh, we'll uh, review the specific stress test we wanna quantify for reserve planning analysis. Okay, Andre, next slide, please. 
So last year's uh, stress test, sorry about the cutoff on the title there. So this is a slide we presented, a picture of the slide that we did last year. Last year we did five stress test scenarios and we we expanded it towards uh, an ERM type of a framework without a comprehensive implementation of ERM. Uh, and the scenarios we looked at was one, scenario one was what if prices were to in decrease significantly? You know, that would mean PCIA is much higher and PG&E's generation rate is a lot lower. How would that affect us? As I mentioned in the budget analysis, that would affect our revenues significantly. Um, but it won't affect our power supply portfolio as much because we have locked in prices through our hedging program. So we may not see as commensurate decrease in power supply expense as we would see a reduction in the revenue side. So that's that's where the harm comes in. The second one had to do is sort of kind of related to the first one, but insufficient financial liquidity. What if we don't have the, the cash to manage the operation? What, that can tr trigger a credit downgrade. Like right now, we're pleased to inform uh, uh, the committee that we have two as the committee most committee members know we have two investment grade credit ratings and that basically tells uh counterparties that that do business with us namely our energy counterparties who supply long-term uh, contracts with us and short-term contracts with us that we're a financially viable counterparty and they should feel confident in extending a line of credit that we can use against them with them uh if those uh, triggers, credit downgrades happen. Those credit lines would disappear. There will be calls on collateral, cash postings to these counterparties. Um, and then there's a proceeding at the CPUC that's still pending called provider of last resort, where the if the proceeding goes as the way PG&E wants it, uh, the requirement would be for us to post substantial amount of cash. Last year, we had we said that that could be as much as $75 million uh, of cash that could be tied up. So we could, in this condition, we want to say, what if we didn't have the financial uh, liquidity to function? And the third had dealt with our power purchase agreements defaulting because of uh, because they locked in lower prices, now they can get higher prices, uh, or they the difficulty they're having because of the supply disruptions in in bringing uh, projects online, uh, and that could mean we're replacing those agreements at higher prices, and we could also potentially incur compliance penalties. The fourth one had to do with load loss because our customers departed to direct access or distributed load. Distributed load meaning they're putting their own uh, rooftop solar and, and battery storage. Fifth one dealt with threat to public services and facilities, and namely we looked at threats in our IT side. And is and it this just was me a, or everything is frozen. Can you guys hear me? Uh, yes, and I can hear now. Yeah, it's okay for me. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. It must be yeah. me. My computer froze a bit. Okay. If let me know where I left off so I can off by, by five seconds, so. Oh, okay, no worries. All right, so last one had dealt with threat to public services and facilities, and this namely dealt with some of the IT risk, which we covered in a closed session of the board because of the nature of the risk, uh, dealing with threat to public services and facilities. So that one, again, so a lot of the first four had to do with financial that uh, risks, and the fifth one dealt more into non-financial that ultimately can materialize into financial. Um, so a lot of the learnings that we did from the last year's stress test are still relevant. So we're propose we're, the stress test I'm going to propose. You'll see some of these same elements will will come in because they're still pertinent, but we're going to refresh it for the latest market conditions and and data. Okay. So we'll go to the next slide and we'll talk about. Uh, stress test and ERM. So last year we did stress tests specifically, but what do we mean by ERM and enterprise? So enterprise risk management basically is a more comprehensive uh, organization-wide risks. So not just the risks 
the risks that I, I went through before, most of them, the first four of them kind of dealt with market conditions, uh, things that could affect us in, in a financial, direct financial consequence to us. But enterprise can deal with all sorts of risks, business and operational risks, staff turnover that can, that can materialize into significant operational risk for us, uh, modeling risk. Uh, regulatory risk, reputational risk that, you know, if we had a data breach that customers lost confidence in, in us, uh, re other regulatory risk. So it's more comprehensive way of assessing risk and most uh, well-run organizations have an enterprise risk management to make sure that they, the organization is, is looking at risks that they should be addressing to make sure they can carry out the the mission and objectives of the organization. So this year, uh, and stress test is, is a one component of that. So in the ERM framework, we will list risk, various risk or risk drivers. Stress test is basically we can go through and say that risk can happen, that risk can happen, that risk can happen in the ERM framework. But what if some of these were to happen together? The perfect storm, like the natural gas scenario I just explained. You know, that's sort of like an extreme but plausible scenario that just happened. A similar scenario that can repeat again, that can adversely affect us. So what are those combination of risk drivers that forms that what we call black swan or tail event? Sometimes you'll hear uh, in, in, in risk management terminology, those extreme but plausible scenarios that can materialize and can affect us adversely. And we did those scenarios last year, and this year we're gonna uh, again do that, but now it's a component of our ERM framework. And stress test is very important as, as the second bullet says about the tr uh, conducting for trading portfolios. And you find this is very uh, prominent in banking industries and in investment banks fi and financial trading portfolios because the inherent weaknesses in, in standard risk metrics that we use, uh, because those risk metrics are not gonna model things like disruptions in markets that can occur. They're not gonna say, what oh, pipeline is gonna be out, right? They're just looking at, at volatility and projecting that volatility forward. But how the volatility would change if, if, if a dynamic of the market were to change, it's not going to be captured in those metrics. So that's why, independent of those other risk metrics that we cover in our risk oversight committee, we are bringing stress tests as, as part of that uh, risk uh, analysis. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So the key components of the ERM, and as I mentioned, the last component stress test is already is, is a key component, an essential component of, 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 of ERM. Uh, one of the key components of ERM is having a risk matrix. And I'll go through that in detail in the next slide. It's basically, basically an assessment of what's the likelihood of an event or risk happening and what's the consequence if the risk were to occur. And this doesn't have to be all quantifiable. Our attempt would be to quantify them, but in an initial step, it could just start with subject matter experts uh, assessment of what's the likelihood and what's the consequence, uh, the financial consequence or consequence on the mission of the organization. And when we come up with a matrix like this, the, the benefit is we can use it to calibrate risks. We want to be a good effective program would highlight, hey, these are the extreme risks organization that where you should be directing your attention and resources on as opposed to some of these lower level risks. Mitigate those that, that basically move the needle the most in terms of effort spend per, per reduction in risk. Um, and the way we do that is we compile a risk register where we brainstorm throughout the organization what what's the, what are the risks plausible risk events that were that are facing the organization we re, so risk register is sort of like a record of risk that we capture we identify what the current mitigations are what the plan mitigations are what how the risk is using the risk matrix wh when the risks if they were not mitigated at all with the current mitigations and with additional plan mitigations where do we want to move on that risk matrix which then describes the, the, uh, the level of risk tolerance. Is there a question? Okay. 
And then the stress test, again, as I said, is a key component of that, where we basically look at the perfect scenario. You know, what if several of the risks were to occur uh, together and, and we were to have that perfect storm occur and what, what could that mean for us? Okay, we'll go to the next uh, slide. So the risk, here's uh, a representation of our initial risk matrix. Again, this is a, we've just started this and we will refine. And as we gain experience, we will, uh, and we will refine it further, and we may even uh, quantify some of their impacts as opposed to just listing it as significant to catastrophic. So on the uh, the left here, uh, the y axis, we have the frequency, the likelihood, you know, something that's not likely, very rare to occur, or something is unlikely but plausible to something that we know there's great certainty that it's going to happen. And then on the x axis, on the on the uh, the up, upper the impact consequence side, we list what the impact of a scenario were. So, example, something could be very certain; it, we know it's going to happen, um, and the risk is easily mitigated. Uh, we can take actions to 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 mitigate those risks, whereas the catastrophic ones are. Uh, usually those are very unlikely or rare. And if, if they were to occur, such as the stress test scenarios, that could be risk of existence, you know, or extreme uh, drawdown of our reserves or, or making us extremely uncompetitive. So our proposal is to use this framework to calibrate risks, identify risk tolerance, acceptance level, use subject matter expertise, uh, and we will move towards quantifying risk, but the stress test analysis, like last year, we will specifically quantify because those we're going to use for reserve planning purposes. And on the next slide, I'll cover the risk register aspect of the of the ERM. Um, so this is just a sample uh, illustrative risk register that we included in the package, and there's more expanded view in the appendix as well as in the staff report. Uh, so risk register, again, we're using it to record risks uh, that as, as an organization, throughout the organization, we, we engage everyone to say, what are the, the risks we're facing? So we kind of brainstorm on, on things that we should be, should be on our radar screen, and we briefly describe each risk. We list our existing and plan mitigation. We rank the risk, and we identify a risk owner, someone who's basically going to project manage the, the management of that risk. Uh, so again, these are risks that we feel are critical that we need to manage so that we can deliver on our mission. And for uh, initially, we have bucketed the risk into four categories, those that have direct financial consequence, those that are uh, driven from regulatory and compliance obligations, those that can have risks on our reputation that can then undermine our ability to deliver on our mission. And those that have a direct operational and business continuity impact, such as like staff turnovers or system failures or modeling failures. So each of those risks, we identify an owner, what mitigations we have, what we want to target, where we think we are unmitigated with the current mitigations and where we want to be. And where we want to be basically then dictates the level of mitigations that we as an organization need to take. So this is something we can assess comprehensively and this is not something we we will be in detail discussing in in at this committee meeting or at the board meetings, but we just wanted to introduce the framework to say the stress tests we are going to quantify, bring to the board, use it for reserve planning. But all of these other enterprise level risks we're going to be managing through this ERM framework, and we will use the CEO's risk oversight committee to go into details of these type of risk. And that's a more appropriate committee where we can we can engage in this level of discussion rather than a public public meeting. Okay, so next scenario will, um, the next slide, sorry. Uh, so the, the stress test that we're planning, again, as I said, it will look pretty much like last year's stress test, but we will update it. The probability of this scenario is probably higher than we were even anticipating last year because 
there are talks of economic recession uh, with the Fed, the way the Fed is managing the, the rate increases. And what that can mean for us is that the price drop scenario that we talked about in model last year, it becomes more likely now. And that could lead to load loss and an increase in customer uh, delinquency. But the bigger impact will come from price drop, which will affect the higher PCIA and lower PG&E rates and affect our revenues, but won't see a commensurate increase, decrease in our power supply expenses because we have locked in power prices to our hedging program. So that's the one that we're concerned about. We still want to model the provider of last resort uncertainty because the CPUC still has not taken any action on this proceeding. So that risk that we modeled last year that, that that can have a huge squeeze on our financial liquidity, that risk still prevails. Uh, so we still wanna capture that. And all the risk that Monica has talked about in, in the power procurement portfolio, in addition to price prices, we have risk from resource advocacy reform and market uncertainties and increased procurement targets from CPUC. We wanna capture a lot of those in this. And we plan to uh, you do a deep quantification of this analysis. Uh, and some of the other analysis like price increases and defaults, we are not gonna update that because we don't expect to learn anything new from what we learned last year. We expect with the learnings from last year to still apply, but this is one we wanna refresh and, and enhance uh, the scenario as I, as I've noted here, and use this for, for our reserve planning analysis. So we will, our plan is to quantify this, bring it back to this committee around May timeframe, and then again, use it for reserve planning as we did last year to say, do we have adequate reserves to withstand this risk model risk scenario, which we ex expect to be the most consequential of, of, of our stress test scenarios. And on the right, I've listed the current reserve uh, mitigations. We obviously have the reserves to withstand this risk. The key is to assess the adequacy of that reserve, like the, or the question that was asked earlier. You know, uh, do we have the right amount of reserves? So that we're going to assess that using this scenario. Uh, again, uh, some of the regulatory risks we mitigate through the advocacy and on the regulatory. Uh, arenas we play in, including the legislature. And then we will also, as we started this analysis last year, we do still have a lot to do on this and uh, consider revisiting our hedging strategy to see if there's some something we can do. It's very difficult analysis to perform because we don't have insights into PCIA or PG&E's generation rate. So it's, it's using a lot of publicly but imperfect data to do the modeling work that we have to do. Uh, I think that was the last slide, right, Andrea? Oh, yeah, the timeline. I, I kind of covered the timeline already. So we will present the ERM framework to the Risk Oversight Committee. We expect to present the framework to the committee in March and then bring those at appropriate uh, cycles will bring the analysis to the risk oversight committee. The stress test analysis want to complete in April, pr pr bring it back to the committee around May, uh, to the board in June, and then incorporate into our annual budget uh, planning process in, in August and September. August is the initial draft of the budget, and September is when the board finally adopts the budget. So this was uh, 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 an informational item. Uh, we're happy to take any feedback uh, the committee may have for us. All right, we're open now for more questions before we go to public comments. Um, Sally? Yes, thank you for a very comprehensive presentation. Takes me back to my forecasting and modeling days, actually. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but... Um, <laughs> So I, I just was curious whether this is all in, I mean, it's very sophisticated. Is it internally devised? Do you have a software package or working with consultants to do it or some combination of the above? I just was impressed with the mechanics of how it's all gonna fit together to be a reliable tool. So it's a combination of both. Uh, the mechanics, the framework, the, the devising of the scenarios and the risks, that's all internal. 
where we use external expertise is in the in the PCIA and PG&E generation modeling, uh, which we have been doing. There's a Cal CCA model. They work with a party called NewGen. And actually, we, one of the few CCAs, uh, actually shaped that model because we engage with them regularly. And we recently uh, proposed a whole bunch of changes to them that we that Cal CCA just adapted that they will support uh, making those changes to that model. So that's why we bring in the external expertise. But a lot of this, uh, the expertise, a lot of this comes from our background uh, in being in this business for for a long, long time. <laughs> it's impressive. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh yes, Director Elliot. Hey there. Uh, yeah, more like a comment, actually. First of all, I just want to say, like, this is great work, guys. Team looks like they're doing an amazing job. In particular, I was really happy to see uh, the economic recession possibility that that's on your guys' minds, because it's certainly on mine. Um, and so, you know, that falls into the be prepared mantra that I like to live my life by. And I like seeing that uh, in the future, it looks like the reserves were predicting to get a little higher and higher, we're, we're meeting those goals. And I, I love seeing that line. And uh, yeah, that's that's about it. I just want to make those comments. I'm really happy to see that. And especially in regards to thinking about the very real possibility of a recession coming on here. Thank you. Appreciate those comments. OK, if there are no more questions, I'll open up to public comment. Uh, seeing none, I'll close to public comments. And this is a um, just discussion item, right? So there's no action required. That's right. OK, if um, everybody's comfortable with this, let's move to the next item, which is at the number five, review of Silicon Valley Clean Energy's second prepaid transaction. I think this is also an information item. Uh, may I That's correct. Report? That report, I'm gonna, you're on again. <laughs> Okay, so this is a very quick report out on our power prepay transaction. You probably saw the um, the email that Andrea sent that that captured most of it, but we wanted to just formally report out on the results uh, that this committee re reviewed and approved and recommended that the board engage in our second prepay transaction. So we'll go to the next slide and very quickly go through this item. Again, this is a report out. Uh, we'll very briefly review the goals of our prepay what the board authorized execution parameters were and, and how we executed relative to those parameters. And I'll go to the next slide. So goal of a prepay, uh, again, uh, most of you are quite familiar because we had, we've had many, many presentations, but we ha do have new members. Um, this is our ability to take advantage of being a tax exempt entity without basically taking debt on our balance sheet. So this is uh, where we can basically effectively legally arbitrage the difference between tax exempt rate and taxable rate and flow those savings back into our power purchases. And this structure is actually codified in law. So it's very legal and has been around since the 90s and predominantly was used in natural gas. Uh, we were one of the first entities to bring it into the, the clean energy space. Our, our objective here is, again, to take advantage of our tax exempt status without taking debt. So debt that is non-recourse to SVCE, flow the savings into our power purchases. And the, the savings, these, these are 30-year uh, term transactions. We will target savings is 8 to 10% a year. And our target is, is usually around 3 to 4 million of savings per year. Um, and again, this is favorable risk allocation, so we don't take on any significant risk in, in doing so. Okay, so those were the high level overview of prepay, but happy to take any detailed questions. Um, and we can go to the next slide, Andrea. So the, when the board authorizes execution of the second prepay, uh, we said we will execute within uh, principal uh, par amount of the bonds will not exceed uh, one billion dollars. It was contingent on uh, achieve, achieving an eight percent savings over power supply contract for the initial bond reset period. That's a key thing. The bonds basically reset after the initial reset period. It's basically sort of like your mortgage 
being repriced. We, the bonds will get repriced in this transaction after six and a half years, in our first transaction after 10 years. And again, and the other condition was that the bonds are not guaranteed obligations of SVCE, and which as I said, are not. So next slide, we'll go through the parameters. And so the principal or the par amount of the bonds were about 841.55 million as opposed to 1 billion. The initial bond reset period was six and a half years and the bonds carried an A1 rating uh, and were designated as green bonds uh, uh, by uh, an independent uh, verifier, crystal verifiers. And uh, the main item here is that we got savings of $9.77 per megawatt hour, which is about 10% of the price that was established, or about $4.7 million for the first six and a half years. What happens after six and a half years? That we will basically reprice and we'll look at market conditions at that point and then basically um, assess whether we want to take on, continue with the prepay transactions. We have a minimum threshold that we've specified of $4.50. If that threshold savings is not achieved, we don't have to continue with the prepay. Uh, but chances are we will because any savings is, is savings as long as there are savings. Uh, but the actual savings we will know, we won't know until uh, the market dynamics at the time the bonds get reset. Uh, so power deliveries, so we begin realizing savings when the powers uh, start flowing, which is expect, which will happen on June 1 of 2023. Okay, next slide, Andrea, please. So next steps, uh, we will work with uh, California Community Choice Financing Authority, CCCFA. This is the third party agency that we CCC, CCA set up, uh, SVC being one of the, the initial found, founders of this organization. This is a conduit through which we issue the bonds and the details again in, in the appendix slides. Uh, we will have ongoing disclosure requirements that we have to comply with, uh, which will work with CCCFA. And we actually have a third party that we've hired that helps with the disclosure through CCCFA. We have to assign power purchase agreements. Initially, we have assigned a two-year short-term energy supply deal. So Monica and our team will continually work to assign our longer-term PPAs into the prepay structure. And we have to do so before the end of the first uh, assigned contract, two years. And then we will continue to monitor the markets. This is obviously a very good mechanism to bring savings. A lot of CCAs have engaged in prepay transactions since we uh, executed. Right after we executed ours, uh, the the large CCA in, in uh, LA County, um, Clean Power Alliance, they just issued a, a a prepay transaction realizing substantial savings. But we will, again, analyze the opportunities. We will look at our power procurement portfolio. We'll work with Monica's team to look at what makes sense, given a, what kind of PPAs we can assign into the PPA transactions, how much of a load coverage we can get, and we'll then decide on any additional uh, uh, transactions to pursue. And we will pursue, but we'll just have to go through the analysis and look for the right timing for a third transaction. That was all I wanted to, um, this was a big item and we just wanted to bring closure by doing a report out. But if there are any questions, I'd love to take them. Uh, questions from the board, please, before we open public comment. This is a lot to take in, I, I know that, but um, I think we, in the past, um, our staff had made really great uh, decisions. So I trust our staff would continue to make really good decisions. So if no uh, questions, I'll open for public comments. Seeing none, I'll close the public comments. So um, discussions, this is information item. So if there's any discussions, time is now. All right, seeing none, let's move. Um, we finish our regular calendar. So we move to comments and staff remarks from committees and board and staff. Yeah, you know, 
I mean, you gave us a lot of information. I think we're kind of, <laughs> after we write back and <laughs> hear about it, we're kind of absorbing it right now. <laughs> well, you'll get to hear the media budget again in, in the board meeting. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, actually, okay. So if there's no um, comments and staff remarks, I will call the meeting adjourned. Thank you for coming.